Well, good morning, church family. So glad that you're here to be with us this morning. Glad that you're um, joining us from wherever you are online, at home, whatever. I invite you to just stand with us as we begin in a word of prayer. Lord, we give you glory and praise for as you've been teaching us, Lord, nothing about Christmas has changed. Even though things are different, circumstances are the way they are in the world, Lord, you have not changed. You are eternal. You are forever. You came and as sure as you came the first time to pay for our sins, to reconcile us to yourself and bring hope and joy and peace and real love into our life, Lord, you will come again. We long for that day. We praise you and thank you that we can sing of your joy and praise you this morning. In your name we pray, amen. <laughs>
lighting the third candle of heaven, which represents joy. God sending of his one and only son to us to reconcile us to himself brings life. And that new life we receive brings true and lasting joy. It's like Peter said, so in this you greatly rejoice, even though for now a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with a joy that's inexpressible and full of glory. Obtaining is the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So we celebrate with joy that comes from knowing Jesus loves us, that he has come for us, that he's reconciled us to himself, and we light this third advent. Oh, 
hands for communion later. All right, how blessed is God and what a blessing he is. He's the father of our master, Jesus Christ, and takes us to the high places of blessing in him. Long before he laid down earth's foundations, he had us in mind. He settled on us as the focus of his love to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into the family through Jesus. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift-giving by the hand of his beloved son. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross, we're a free people, free of penalties and punishments chalked up by all our misdeeds. And not just barely free either, abundantly free. He thought of everything, provided for everything we could possibly need, letting us in on the plans he took such delight in making. He set it all out before us in Christ, a long-range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in him, everything in deepest heaven, everything on planet Earth. It is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that are ours in you. Lord, we thank you for the hope, for the help that we have in any and every season. And Lord, we thank you so much that not only that you came, but that you shed your blood for us. Lord, we do love you, and we just give you all the praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. This morning after the service, we have uh, youth, Sunday school, and children's ministry at 11 o'clock. You know, our plan, our hope was to do some Christmas caroling this week. The county's asking us not to do that, but we're working on an alternative, and we may get together on one of these upcoming Saturdays. I don't know if you heard this. I found this fascinating. Gallup and some of the other polling groups, which I'm not a big fan of, but I like Gallup just released uh, some findings that through this whole pandemic, there's only one group of people that are doing okay, that are feeling good. Guess who? Christians. Who, not just Christians, Christians who worship and meet together regularly, whether it's in Zoom or in person. So I find that fascinating and good that we have that blessing in him. So remember this month, uh, we've got the Outside the, the doors, we've got baskets set up for food and appreciate all the people that have been bringing food. The collection is growing. And you know, I'd say if there's anybody in our church family, if you need help, there's no embarrassment in that. There's no shame in that. That's what we were supposed to do as a family. And it's our, our deep desire to be able to help you, you know, whether it's picking toys for the kids or having a turkey or a ham or whatever for, for Christmas. We're collecting things that we want to give out. If you have people in your neighborhood or people you're aware of that need help, Please let us know. That's why we're collecting food, and the leadership offering is going to coincide with that, whether it's being able to help people in need, whether it's buying toys. That's what we want to do. That's what we think the church is supposed to be. Also, good news, our little giving, you know, things we're going to put outside for giving food and water and books and things away to the community, they're about done, and it should be up this week. So that's an exciting thing. Uh, We will be doing a, a Christmas Eve service. We really, that was our hope, was that we could open on Christmas Eve. Right now, we're not so sure about that, but we will be gathering one way or another for Christmas. So let's pray. Lord, I do thank you so much for the hope that is ours in you. Lord, I pray that we would not allow our circumstances to rob us of the true joy, the true meaning of Christmas, because it's all about you. Lord, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for being so good to us. And Lord, we eagerly await all the blessings and things that await us as we come one day to see you, and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to continue our study of Jesus' last evening on earth before his death and resurrection by examining a well-known, and I think it's a much-loved section of Scripture, uh, the events in the Garden of Gethsemane. I think you're going to learn some new and encouraging things this morning, so why don't you turn with me your Bibles to Matthew 26, 36. Matthew 26, 36. And then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. And then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. Now we see that Jesus and his disciples came to a place called Gethsemane. It was west of the Mount of Olives. The name Gethsemane literally means olive press, so it may have been an olive grove with its own press. And then he left eight of the disciples in one place, 
while he and his inner circle of disciples, you know, Peter, James, and John, went on a little bit further to pray. Now keep in mind, these same three men had accompanied Jesus at his transfiguration, and it appears that they were with him for companionship and support. But it may also be significant, if you think about this, that these three men who had explicitly declared their readiness to share his fate were with him. Remember, we saw this back in John chapter 20 where, um, I'm sorry, in Matthew chapter 20 where John's mother and his brother's James' mother had come to Jesus and asked that her two sons be put one at the right and one at the left. So these two power positions, and Jesus said to them, okay, are you, you, know, are you able to drink the, the cup? that I'm going to have to endure. And, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem, Lord. And then last week we saw Peter telling Jesus, yeah, I'm with you to the end. I'm hanging in there. So I think it's, it might be very significant that it was these same three who had made these promises were now with him to share with him in preparing for that cup. And as you probably know, even at that, they're going to fail. Now, knowing the physical and emotional and spiritual torture he was about to face, Jesus was grieved and distressed. Matthew used those words to describe the, the extreme emotional sorrow and distress that Jesus was experiencing. And Jesus' own words further expanded his emotional state. He said, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. And so in sorrow, he instructed his three closest friends to stay near and keep watch with him, probably to support him through their own prayers. But honestly, I find it fascinating that Jesus, being fully God, would put his emotional well-being in the hands of his creatures. Now, these words uh, that we have translated here as deeply grieved, I, I have to tell you, they don't adequately convey the meaning of the original Greek words, which, are, which really suggest it literally mean, meant an anguish of wretchedness. You know, it was anguish to the greatest possible extreme. It was, it was horrible. And, and by the way, his words, my soul is deeply grieved, also echoes Psalm 42, 5 and 6, 42, 11, and 43, 5. And it may well define the cause of that, grief. Because Jesus is you know, now we're hours away before his death. But, but I want you to note, we'll talk more about this later, but he wanted the companionship and fellowship of his friends. Now look at verse 39. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass for me. And yet not as I will, but as you will. So, you know, moving on a little bit further, Jesus fell on his face, a posture communicating desperate entreaty, and he prayed to his father. You know, many times as we've been studying this gospel, we've seen other people come up and, you know, fall on their faces before Jesus. But this is the only time recorded in Scripture that he's said to have, you know, fallen on the ground. You know, the idea is prostrating himself. And that posture is important because it indicates a surge of emotion sort of swept over him that led to prayer. Now, I also want to point out something very subtle but important. The words, my father, it shifts this from an abject appeal to the intimate communion of the son with his father, whose will, he says, he delights to do. Now, you've got to understand that the issue here is not whether Jesus should accept the father's purposes. The issue is whether that purpose needs to include the horrifying cup of vicarious suffering that he talked about back in chapter 20, or whether there was some other way. So what we have in this verse is a remarkable blend of a clear request with the acceptance that this request may not be granted. That is so important for us to understand. Really, this is something that we would do well to imitate in our own pro li prayer life with its often inflexible demands. I won't speak for you, but I know sometimes I go to the Lord and it's like I have my, my list. Here's what you need to do, God, and you need to do this, and you need to do that, and, and this is how I want them done. A lot of times we actually approach the Lord without reverence and rather rigidly in, a, in, in ordering or instructing him what it is that he ought to do. But we're reminded here that ultimately the only thing that matters are the limits 
of God's will. These lines, these boundaries that God set, you know, it's, it's about what he knows to be the best thing. And here's the thing, and the reason I bring this up, Jesus' prayer here is an exploration of those limits. He's probing, but he never attempts to break out of them. Now, this is also extremely important to note. His reason, you've got to see this. We've been talking a lot about this. It was in our Bible study Wednesday night, the importance of looking at Scripture in context. Well, his request to be spared suffering and death, you've got to understand, was the desperate cry of a son's heart to his father. That's what we have here. He understands what needs to happen, but this is like you're seeing this beautiful inner, inner inside of Jesus and the Father's relationships. It's very personal and intimate. And his father accepted that prayer as a loving father, but without granting it. And the son accepted his father's love, but without receiving his specific request. So here's what we have. We have a son's loving request and a father's loving wisdom. And again, this should be a model for our own prayers to the Father. We come openly, you know, honestly. We share exactly what we are feeling, whether we know it's right or wrong. It's just, Lord, just kind of here's how I feel. Here's what I'm experiencing. But I also recognize that he, you know, there used to be a show, some of you would remember, Father Knows Best. Well, God the Father knows best. We're going to talk more about that in a few minutes, but we can trust him. Now, I also want to point out that this cup, in case you missed it or have forgotten, that cup refers not only to Christ's suffering and death, which, by the way, is a fulfillment of Isaiah 51, 22, Jeremiah 25, 15, and 16, and Ezekiel 23, 31 through 34, but even more uniquely, it refers to the Father's wrath against sin. We've talked about that before. Wrath is an attribute of God. I think this was an anticipation of Matthew 27, 46, where when we get there, we're going to see Jesus is on the cross and the Father just turns away from him. Probably the worst point in that whole thing. But, but I want to be clear, Jesus' extreme grief was rooted in the fact that he was about to become the object of his father's wrath, an experience that sadly many people are going to face in eternity, which no one but the Son of God could possibly anticipate ahead of time. So what I'm saying is the father's wrath was about to crush the son, as was prophesied and foretold in Isaiah 53.10 even though the son had done nothing wrong. And again, let's look at this setting, this context. See, Jesus was facing so much more than humiliation and torture and physical death. I'm going to be blunt. He was about to enter hell. And can you imagine how fearful that prospect was to him? Plus, he and the father had always been one. And no wonder he cried out in desperation. No wonder he asked. He wanted to confirm that. But we must not, we must not confuse Jesus' honest expression of his feelings and desire with a willful decision to disobey. Because he immediately said, yet not as I will, but as you will. See, as always, the son remained submitted to the father. And, and of course, he knew this and we know this. There was no other way to fulfill the eternal plan. Keep this in mind. The eternal plan that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit had foreordained from eternity, from the beginning. His mission was to defeat the adversary by restoring the kingdom and redeeming a rebellious people. Now look at verse 40. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So Jesus has gone off to pray. When he returns, he finds the three asleep. So he rebuked Peter on behalf of them all. We know he's talking about all of them because um, he used plural verbs throughout these verses. 
And I, you know, I don't think he expected an answer to his question, could you not keep watch with me for one hour, which, by the way, watch simply means stay awake. And, and there's more to this. The disciples falling asleep at such a time reveals that they were completely unaware of the spiritual danger around them, and their guard was down. They weren't on alert. <clears throat> And when Jesus commanded them to watch and pray, he was referring to more than just staying awake physically. Now, keep in mind, they were on the verge of entering into the temptation to deny and abandon him. And they were going to need God's help to stand firm, or they would literally be caught napping. And I believe Jesus was not only asking them to pray for him, but for themselves. I mean, he knew they were going to need extra strength to face the challenges and temptations that lay ahead. This temptation to either run away or deny the relationship with him. Now, I also want to point out that the words enter into can also be translated as fall into. So he wanted them to pray, you know, that, that their faith didn't collapse. And this word temptation can mean testing or trial. So sort of bottom line, he wanted them to pray for strength you know, to get through this coming ordeal, this trial that was about to happen. Again, they're a few hours away from watching Jesus die. Would, that he believe, would they believe that he was the Messiah? You know, how would they deal with all the fear, the anxiety, I and mean, try to put yourself in their place? All those thoughts, all those concerns, the loneliness, the grief, all that just flood of emotions... You know, would they be able to hold fast? I also want to point out that we see that Jesus acknowledged their willingness to remain loyal when he said, the spirit is willing. But again, they were, they were completely unaware just how weak their flesh really was. And without prayerful dependence on God and continual spiritual watchfulness, the flesh would win at the first moment of weakness. Now, you can be sure that Matthew intended the exhortation of verse 41, you know, about this idea of keep watching and praying, uh, to be applied beyond the immediate problem of their inability to stay awake on this, you know, on this particular night. You know, the, the weakness of the, ple the flesh is a permanent problem for Christians. And it calls for constant vigilance and the kind of prayer that, you know, Jesus taught his disciples all the way back to Matthew 6, 13. What is Matthew 6, 13? What, what's that aspect of the prayer? You know, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. That's the kind of thing that they needed to be, you know, praying and focusing on. Now let's continue on, verse 42. He says, keep... Verse, what was, verse 42, he went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. So we see that you know, Jesus leaves them again to pray. And this time, the words Matthew recorded demonstrate less distress and even greater resolve to obey. This is a clearer statement than the previous prayer, which is sort of fragmented. And then after some time, he came back to the three. But once again, he found them asleep. And we get a little insight here, easy to miss. But Matthew says, because their eyes were heavy. See, he's acknowledging their human limitations. This is the explanation. And Jesus seemed to accept that too, since this time he didn't rebu rebuke them. And then he sought the companionship of the Father a third time, not having found it among his disciples. Now look at verse 45. And then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. So, for a third time, Jesus returned to the disciples. The hour is at hand, he declared. You know, there was, there was no longer any time for sleeping or prayer. And he, he woke them with a rebuke that might be taken as a question. You know, are you still sleeping and resting? 
And, and let's, be, let's be clear. Jesus was not satisfied with their lack of faithfulness. In this incredible hour of despair, they just left. They didn't hang in there with him. And, and he was not pleased. And his word, you know, behold, may have drawn their attention to the approaching crowd or perhaps the light of their torches. It's not like they would have street lights up there. But the time of preparation was over and the action was about to begin. He was going to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Now, that word sinners refers to those who rejected his authority as the Messiah and were about to arrest him and execute him as a criminal. And with the crisis at hand, Jesus called his disciples to action, saying, you know, get up. Let's be going. And, he, and he's drawing their attention to the reality all, you know, around them as this group of people led by Judas Iscariot was approaching. But there's a really important thing I noticed here that I, I want you to see. Because of that time that Jesus had spent in prayer, the Messiah King was ready for what lay ahead. You think about this. If you, if you were in a position where you knew there were people coming to kill you, arrest you and kill you, and you could see them a, a, a good distance away, what would you have done? You know, I know I'd have been running. But see, and I think most people would have run. But Jesus' purpose was not to escape. And as we're going to see, so he boldly just went out to meet his enemies. No fear. So what else can we learn? You know, what is it that we need to take away from this beautiful section of Scripture that can make a difference in our own lives? Well, there's five truths that really stood out to me. You know, first of all, the disciples, in spite of all the teaching, all the preparation, of all the things that Jesus had showed them about what had to happen, they still did not understand the danger awaiting them that night. They were completely unaware, and I think that happens to us more often than we might want to admit. Scripture, the New Testament, Paul especially, is constantly telling us to be vigilant, to be on guard, to understand that we live in enemy territory. Second thing that we see, and it's kind of sad, is that Jesus was alone in his anxiety and grief since his best friends kept falling asleep. They just they pretty much abandoned him, really, emotionally. Third, and this is another important aspect, Jesus was fully human at this time and fully God, and he longed for the emotional support of his friends. At such a time as this, he wanted those men that he'd shared his life with, that he loved, and he knew they loved him. He wanted their companionship. He wanted their encouragement, the, the comfort of being together. Four, Jesus remained loyal to doing his Father's will, in spite of his knowledge that he was about to endure the agony of crucifixion. And you've got to understand that in his death on the cross, he was going to endure unthinkable separation from his father. Think about this. I, I don't know how to, what, what kind of words to use because as I understand it, God has always existed. And, and, and how many, how many millennial, how many thousands, whatever, hundreds of thousands of years, I don't know. But the father and the son have always been together until this coming moment. That's a, that's a, Hard thing to wrap our minds around, but it, it, it's clear that it impacted him and it affected him. And of course, his death was like no other death that's occurred, heroic or otherwise. See, this is not martyrdom. This is self-sacrifice. And the sacrifice he's going to make is greater than any sacrifice that's ever been made. And fifth, and this is the one I really want to sort of spend the rest of our time on this morning is some observations about what we can learn from his prayer that night. Um, you know, Jesus prayed that night as no human being has ever prayed. He prayed, Luke tells us, with such intensity that his sweat became like drops of blood. I did a little medical research. That's a very rare situation, but it can happen. When it does 
Because of that intensity, the blood is pushed through the pores of the skin. And it reveals two important things to us. One, look at the intensity with which he's praying. But the other side of it that we cannot miss, because this is really important for us to take away, is the intimacy that's involved in this time of prayer between father and son. And, and I just, I realize as I've been working on this the last couple of weeks is that we, that we've, we've done series on prayers, we've studied all kinds of elements of prayers. I don't know why I never really looked at this one to this degree, but we have so much to learn about prayer from Jesus' example that night in Gethsemane. And that's what I want to draw your attention to in our closing minutes. First thing that I saw was that it teaches us the necessity of prayer, real prayer, especially when things are bad, when things are hard and life seems intolerable. Sometimes we sort of curl up in a ball and just give up. We don't communicate, but what we have here, this lesson is the, wor- the harder things are, the more difficult, the more challenging thing they are in your life, the more we need to pray. And I'm not just talking about just sending up words. I'm talking about seeking intimate fellowship with God. I mean, put in its context, when the most important and demanding action in world history was about to take place, It had to be grounded, it had to be rooted in prayer, in fellowship with God. See, Jesus knew something that many of us give lip service to but don't necessarily practice. He understood that it was a vital necessity. And again, I'm not talking about you and I sitting down and giving God his to-do list. That's not how the Bible defines prayer. That's got an aspect to it, but we're talking about intimate fellowship between an individual and God. It's being together in the deepest possible sense. And for our Lord, this was an absolute necessity. Should it be any less for us? Now, another thing that I saw here, and I've missed this one before. His example that night in the garden teaches us the value of corporate prayer. I mean, Jesus longed for the encouragement of a shared prayer time with his closest friends. That's what he knew he needed. That's what he wanted. But they were too tired and they failed him. They just couldn't even hang in with him, as he said, for an hour. And I think that's something we're we're trying to work on. I know the prayer minister wants to address that, but... You know, it's amazing. We could have 300 people come to church on Sunday morning. We could have 100 people come to a midweek service, and we have five show up for the prayer service. We have a hard time getting people to come out to pray. What does that say to us? What does that reveal from God's perspective about what that relationship really means? Because our Lord himself greatly valued corporate prayer. And again, I'm not just talking about just throwing a lot of stuff out there. Uh, Here's another interesting one I want to throw out to you. His example in the garden teaches us that there is just incredible value in repeated or repetitious prayer. I mean, but we have Jesus kept praying the same thing over and over again. And he prayed with all of his heart that this cup of suffering awaiting him might be taken away. Now, let me, let me clarify something here. This kind of repetition is not the, re, the vain repetition of the Gentiles that Jesus condemned in the Sermon on the Mount where they're, you're just basically, your mind and heart is engaged, you're just babbling words and repeating formulas, nor is it what he condemned about the religious leaders of his day where it's just, you know, all words and no substance, no heart. See, When you and I keep taking a certain issue or issues before the Lord over and over again, it shows God that we're serious. See, it is so easy for us and it's so shallow to pray once 
and then walk away and think no more about it. I, I know some people are always, they're, they're sort of net response about anything. Well, I prayed about it. Great, you prayed about it. Did God answer? Did you get a clear response supported by Scripture? You just, is that, because I hear it all the time. I prayed about it. Okay, what's that mean? And I think many times what you and I do, an issue comes up, of course we pray, and then because God doesn't suddenly, you know, part the heavens and answer what we want, what do we do? Then we, then we go about and take, try to take care of it on our own, right? Okay, I prayed, now I'm going to go do what I think is best. Or we do the old one of, Lord, I'm about to go do this, bless me as I go. That's not what the Bible would define as prayer. Not real prayer. See, when we keep praying, when we keep bringing, whether it's a people or situations or issues before the Lord, it shows trust. It shows a determination and confidence, and it demonstrates a seriousness and commitment that is a vital, essential aspect of prayer. You know, in, Matt, in Luke chapter 18, Jesus taught this very lesson. He, he tells a parable about a woman, a widow, who was, was being ill-treated and needed justice, and she went to the judge, and because she was poor and didn't have many resources, he just didn't, you know, didn't do anything. But what does he tell us? She just kept going back and going back to the point that the judge finally says, man, this woman's going to wear me out. She's going to destroy me if I don't do what she wants, and he did it. He used that as an example for the importance of repetition. And again, I'm not talking about when you're, we're going we're gonna to get a, there's a little bit of a, uh, what's the word I want to use? Maybe it's a disclaimer, I don't know, but there's a, another part of that that I have to add to that in a minute. Because if, if what you're doing is you just keep repeatedly telling God what he needs to do, don't waste your time. That's not going to work. But I think the, the, the issue that struck me the most about this prayer and what happened that night is this next one I want to share with you. Because this really, I really had to stop when I saw that it was there. It, it just kind of blew me away. Because you see, what happened that night in Gethsemane, in Jesus' prayer to the Father, teaches us some incredibly important lessons about unanswered prayer. I think that's an issue that, if we're honest, all of us struggle with. I prayed for this and this and this, and nothing happened. I prayed for this person. I prayed in this situation. And you didn't answer, God. And then many times, there are people that, because bad things happened or things didn't go the way we want, we're upset with God. We're angry. We're hurt. So what can we learn about that from this? Well, again, put in its setting. Here we have Jesus Christ, the Son of God, praying, and he was not answered. And yet he was in the most intimate relationship possible with the Father. You know, we can only aspire to what they already had. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 5, 7. He's been talking about Christ, and he says, In the days of his flesh, so in the incarnation, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one, capitalized, so it's the Father, to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. See, the Father heard Jesus, but the answer was not in the affirmative. It wasn't, yes, yeah, sure, whatever you like. And, and by the way, that dispels this, I think it's blasphemous, but I'll just say almost blasphemous suggestion that I hear all the time in Christian circles that, you know, you get... Again, they, they do two key things. One, they get two or three people together, taking what that passage really says completely out of context. We've got two or three people, and God's word says, ask, you know, if you ask believing, you have whatever you ask, which again is a complete abuse and distortion of that passage. But I hear it all the time that, you know, anything you ask will be granted in prayer if you just have enough faith. I've had people, especially when I was younger in my faith, 
Oh, you know, you just didn't have enough faith. You just didn't believe enough. God wanted to do it, but you lacked faith, so it didn't happen. That's spurious. That's, and, and here's the proof to completely debunk such fabrications and myths. You know, Jesus had complete trust. He had a perfect relationship with God the Father. He had the utmost faith. He was passionate and sincere, and he was heard. But he was not answered in the affirmative. Sure, whatever you want. You know, actually, it's instructive. Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews continues. He says, although he was a son, son of God, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, literally complete, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Powerful. See, Jesus' perfect relationship with the Father Praise. The answer is no. And for him, that was it. You see, the father in his inscrutable wisdom had to say no to the prayer of his son. Why? Because otherwise there would have been no salvation for anyone. And the kingdom would have shattered and fallen apart. I'm going to point something out to you. Go back to Matthew 26. Verse 36. I'm sorry, verse 42. I gave that all wrong to you. I'm complete. I wish we could edit the tape, but we can't. Go to Matthew 36, 42. There's the latter part of verse 42. My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. And guess what? The father took Jesus at his word. And see, his prayer, I think this is so important, his prayer in Gethsemane shows us that we can be close to God, we can pray with faith and expectancy, we can be living a holy life and not get what we ask for. I can't answer it all. All I can say is this is a profound mystery to which we must bow and say, Father, you know best even when I don't like it or I don't understand it. But I, when it struck me so hard this week, just looking at this, it, and he's dealing with this, which is, again, as I said earlier, I think this is a real challenge for us. I think, let me restate this slightly differently. Jesus prayed with a clear objective, which all you know, his, his humanity longed for. But first and foremost, more than anything else, what he wanted was for God the Father's will to be done. We've talked about this many times, but let me remind you, genuine prayer does not seek to manipulate God or to get its own way. Genuine prayer is opening up to God. I've said this to you before, I would rather be open with my emotions and repent later, but I don't want to try to pretend and Dear God, and go through all the, the, the words when that doesn't reflect my heart. If my heart is hurting, if I'm scared, if I'm mad, even if I'm mad at God, I try to do that respectfully, but I tell him. It's cathartic. It helps me to get it out. It kind of purges it. I need to be honest, and it helps me be honest with myself. But see, it's doing what we're told elsewhere in Scripture. It's welcoming the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. In other words, genuine, genuine prayer seeks to surrender to the will of God. I can't speak for you, but I can tell you that even as I was working on it this week, I cannot tell you how many times I have prayed, and especially when I'm hurting, when I'm lonely, when I'm going through hard times, I've said things that God, I think in his sense of humor, reminds me of every now and then, and then I just have to hit the ground in, in repentance. I am so thankful that God has not answered many of my limited, self-centered prayers. I've said this to you before. This woman is sitting in the second row as my wife. I would never have married her. 
I would have made so many mistakes, I'd have never gotten to the point of waiting on God and what he wanted. I would have settled for so much less than he had. I've seen people do that in their families, with their career choices, in so many places. Because, and it's, it's absurd, but somehow we think we know best. We think we know how to maximize our happiness and joy. And we'd see, look at the disciples. All the boastful stuff we saw last week, they had no idea what was going to happen to them in a couple hours. Same is true of you and me. You and I don't, we barely know what's going on now, let alone two hours from now, but God sees it all, and he's working, and he has a plan. I went as far the other day because I realized I was supposed to. I thank God for the coronavirus. I thanked him because I can see when I get past how it makes me feel how he's been working and how lives are being changed, and I realize he's got far greater purposes going than I do. But so often, we're upset we don't realize that if God tells us no or he says wait, it's because he loves us so much and he actually knows what is best and what he has in store for us. But we're so impatient and we think we're so wise that the reality is even we, most of us are smart enough not to, to ask, say it out loud or pray it this way, we're really telling God we know better than he does. I've said this before, if scripture says that God's will is good acceptable and perfect. If you believe that, which apparently most of us don't, if you did believe that, why would you want anything other than God's will to be done in your life in any situation? Why would you just, I want it my way. I do that. Wished I didn't. But I'm assuming you do that sometimes too. We can trust God. We can be certain that whatever he has is the best thing. Another thing we see here is, that, you know, I just point out, other people have died with a lot of bravery. There are people, you read military stories, there are people who have given their lives for their, their army buddies or navy buddies. We've seen people give their lives for family members and loved ones, even strangers. But they have not sweated blood as they contemplated their end. I want you to understand because of taking all that sin and all the things that we can't even begin to grasp, no one has ever had to face a fraction of what Jesus had to face as he took responsibility for all the sin of the world. And see, I don't think it was the prospect of physical suffering and you know, the, the mocking and all that and crucifixion that caused his sweat to become like drops of blood that night. I think it was the bearing of all that sin. He was going to bear on the cross all the sins that had been committed to that point in human history and all the sin to come from then to now and whenever he comes again. I, I, my little brain just has no way to really grasp all that. But I want you to see that this, that night he was alone, neglected, misunderstood, and in a few hours, he was going, you know, in immediate, immediately he was going to be betrayed. And then he was going to be denied by his closest friends. But he faced the cross and sufferingly, suffering willingly and at such great cost. And the sins of the world, yours and mine included, were going to cut him off. He was going to taste hell on that cross. And that night in the garden... He got his first taste of what it was going to cost him. And that outcome he must face alone. You know, this week as I was just thinking about this passage and these things, I realized that the only way that you and I can remain loyal to Jesus in spite of our weaknesses, if we stay constantly alert to the danger around us, to the temptations and we depend continually on God through prayer. We are not going to make it through apart from that. We can't. And whatever's going on, instead of trying to do it our way or working things out, we've got to recognize. Remember what we saw back in the Beatitudes. Blessed, you know, are the broken in spirit because they recognize without God, no hope, no chance. He, again, Jesus prayed. If it is possible, knowing full well 
that his request could not be granted if he were to be, remain obedient. And his example should be a comfort to us. It should be a, a great model for us. But my friends, we need to pour out our hearts to God honestly, even if we know our deepest desire is not what he's going to want to grant. I, I, I can tell you, there's many times I pray and I know that what I'm praying, what I want, doesn't line up with scripture. It's my own thing. Sometimes, that, especially if you're mad or hurt, that you tend to pray things that hopefully God doesn't answer. But we need to be honest with him because that helps us be honest with ourselves. And there are times that we, we pray because he tells us to and we take him, but we realize that the best thing really isn't for us to get what we want. But I want you to understand this almost more than anything else this morning. God wants you to be able to come to him feeling the safety of total honesty. If you come and you're mad or you're really hurt or you're really scared, he can handle that. But it's far better for you and I to be honest with what we really feel and think and get it out in front of God than to just let it sit there and we print it to be good little boys, Christians and girls and all this stuff and just it just sits there eating us out from the inside. That's not healthy. That's not good. And ultimately, it's going to undermine your fellowship and relationship with the Lord. See, he wants us to know that he is ready and willing to handle the cries of our hearts and our souls. You look around, we live in this blame society today. You know, some people blame their troubles on circumstances or my life is this way because of that person. Today it's because of viruses and shelter in place, bad luck, you know, you know all the lists. But here's the thing. But Christians know, at least we should know, that God rules. He's in control. So we make our requests according to his will, knowing that he's a good God and he's a loving God and he really does know what's best in any and every situation. Now, this is really important for you to understand. When you do that, you're going to find peace and strength and it will take away the bitterness of the cup that you're facing. But here's the other side of that truth, because we've got to be honest. It doesn't always remove the cup. Because God's very clear, Jesus was very clear. God's will for our lives includes some pain. It includes some loss. It includes some adversity and struggles. But those things shouldn't make us feel hopeless or abandoned. And if you lit it, God's peace will assure you of his presence and care. My greatest times in God have always come when I'm the most beat up and lonely and broken. Maybe that's because then I'm finally as fully receptive as I should be, but I've never gone to God in prayer and that deep thing and not just had him come in. That, now, when that time was over, it didn't mean suddenly everything was perfect. Out there, the things that hurt me were still there. The people that hurt me were still there. But there was this thing in my heart. There was a peace that it was like, the assurance I always receive from him, and I've seen it happen to many other people, is just this, and this is the biggest thing. I'm here. I'm with you. That's the game changer. And I just want to tell you, don't be afraid to pray, don't be afraid to pray for his will to be done. You can trust him. He knows what is best. But I also want to warn you before we close that when you are seeking to obey God, when you want God's will to be done in your life, when you want to walk close with him, when you're growing in your love for him, you need to expect temptation and trials to come your way. It's what Jesus said here. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, if you look in your Bibles, that word spirit is lowercase. It's not talking about the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it's talking about the human spirit. What that means is that although your spirit may be willing, your flesh is weak. And if we apply that truth to the disciples here, we see that, we've, we looked at this in detail last week, their inner desires and intentions, as they had previously said, 
was to never deny Jesus. And they really believed that they would die with him if necessary. That's how they felt. You got to understand something. They were eager to serve Jesus in any way possible. They loved him. He's not a bunch of flakes, uncommitted, you know. They loved him. But as we're going to see in the coming weeks, their human inadequacies and fears would make it really difficult to carry out and fulfill all those good intentions. Paul talks about this. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. I, I say, amen, Paul. I wish I didn't know that, but I do. We have good intentions. We want to live a certain life. We want to trust the Lord. We want to do these things. But if we're not alert and if we're not maintaining this constant communication and fellowship with the Father and the Son and, and the Holy Spirit, we're going to fall. We're going to keep missing the mark. Now, the last thing I wanted, and I found this to be really cool and encouraging, According to Psalm 51, 12, it's really cool. A willing spirit needs the Holy Spirit to empower it and help it do God's will. We've got to want his will to be done. I'm not talking about you just pray it and don't mean it, but when you really want God's will to be done, it still won't happen without the power of the resident Holy Spirit. There's never going to be a time when you and I were just sheer grit and determination. We're going to be able to grind it out and go the right way. We're not created that way. We're not intended that way. We're not that powerful. God never asked us to live his life in our own strength. He's constant. Come to me. You are weary and heavy laden. Come to me. Let me fill you. Let me strengthen you. Let me be the one accomplishing things through you. Now here we have Jesus use Peter's drowsiness to warn him to be spiritually vigilant against the temptations he was about to face. See, the only way to resist temptation is if you stay alert and you pray. And here's the other one. It's a dirty word in our culture today. You have to obey. The things he's revealed in his word, the things the Spirit shows you you need to do, you need to do them. And this means being aware of the possibility of temptation. You've got to be sensitive to the subtleties and resolve, and resolve to fight and obey courageously. Because if you've been at this any time, you already know temptation always strikes where and when we are most vulnerable. When we're weak, when we're not maintaining that right connection with God, that's when the temptations come, that's when the issues come, all these things just start, isn't it amazing how they just start coming our way? And the truth is, and this is what we see here, we cannot resist alone. Prayer is essential because only God's strength can build up our defenses and defeat Satan. We can't live this life on our own. We can't defeat the enemy. We can't resist temptation on our own. But, but praise God, Scripture says he's always going to provide a way out if we'll take it. The problem is more often than not, we won't take it. So here's what I'm going to close with. When challenges and temptations strike, when they come your way, the first thing you need to do is pray. And I'm not talking about, and off you go. I'm talking about pray, engaging with God, staying in there. You know, it's kind of that idea, I picture this sometimes in my mind, where it's like I'm hanging on to the feet of God until he lets me go or shows me something. I'm not talking about throwing up a few casual things. I'm talking about enter into this relationship, and if I'm hurting or I don't understand, I'm going to tell him that. I'm going to ask him to show me that in his word. I'm going to ask him to show me that through his spirit or send brothers and sisters in my way that can help me. But I'm not talking about you just throw up a quick prayer and off you go. The second thing I want to point out is start praying with other people. That's where you're going to find strength and support. It's so encouraging to me when people say, I'm praying for you. I'm hanging in there. I, you know, I'd had some interesting things happen in our, our neighborhood earlier this year that I didn't like, and uh, it was really tough. And suddenly it was like God parted the Red Sea, and I was talking to Stenia, who's sitting in the front row. You can't see her right now, but I was talking to Stenia, and she was like, well, I'm not surprised. You know we've been praying. You know? 
But that was such an encouragement to me. And they'd taken up the cause and supported me in prayer. That's why it's just crazy that we, we pray so little together. You know, I really like what Billy Graham said. He said, more can be done by prayer than anything else. You know, brothers and sisters, prayer is our greatest resource, it is our most powerful weapon. Because you realize, we talked about this a long time ago, in, 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 I like to think in military terms sometimes, to me, in simplest terms, prayer is a hotline to God. It's my walkie-talkie. I'm down here on the battlefield, I'm talking to my commander-in-chief who sees the whole field, who sees everything, and it's like, okay, I feel like this, or this is going on. It's my lifeline. And I'll be honest, when I don't do it the way I should, when I don't spend that time that I should, I am weak, and that's when I mess up. Prayer is an incredible gift. It's an amazing weapon. So, you know, I have to ask, what are you doing with it? What does your prayer life reveal about what you really think about God, what your relationship with him is really like? And one of the questions that he usually brings to my mind, and you guys will know why, is when you pray, who does most of the talking? <laughs> if it's you, that's not necessarily prayer. I read something in my devotions yesterday, and it was timely from the Lord. Charles Stanley was talking about this very passage, and one of the ones he uses is, is also Hebrews 5.8. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. He said, take comfort in this thought today. Even though Jesus is God in the flesh, it took an act of his will to obey when pain and affliction were involved. This is because anyone can submit to another's authority when there are rewards promised. But when the immediate effect of our obedience is hardship and pain, the decision is not so easy. Now listen to this. The adversity you are facing today will help you decide whether you really believe in the Lord's wisdom and provision or not. We see Jesus makes, make this decision in Gethsemane when he said, Father, if you were willing, remove the cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. But understand, the process of growing your faith is supposed to be challenging. Boy, that's true. This is because when you have to choose the more difficult path, when you must make painful decisions or you simply cannot imagine how the Lord could work things out for your good, it cements your commitment to him. Obeying God in the tough decisions readies you for both his assignments and his great blessings. Thankfully, you have a Savior who understands your pain and fears completely. And he's committed to leading you faithfully. So obey no matter the cost and trust him. Lord, I thank you for being our Savior. I thank you for your love, for your grace. Lord, I pray that these things we've learned this morning will not just become idle and something we give lip service to, but Lord, teach us, help us to just engage you deeply in fellowship and communion, which is what prayer is. Lord, we... Lord, our times are in your hands, no matter what we read or hear. Lord, you are running the show. Lord, we're going to find our hope, our help, not on who wins an election, but on who our Savior, who our God is. And we need you. And I pray that you would do that work in our hearts today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm excited that we get to uh, partake in Holy Communion ever since we studied the things two weeks ago about the Passover. But do you see how this theme just continues to go through? You can see it woven through the New Testament. It's, it's powerful. You know, look, we're on video. You're watching this probably on a computer, except for the people that are here this morning. You can pause it. You can do whatever you need to do. But I want to encourage you. Use that time to just connect with the Lord. To just recognize what he's done. We, again, we talked about that a few weeks ago. But when you realize what we're celebrating, what we're recognizing today, is the fact that God died so we could live. He did that willingly. He did that because that's how much he loves us. And I don't know about you, but it's been so weird to me that here we are studying the end of Jesus' life, and it's Christmas, the birth. But yet I've been realizing that those two are so inseparably linked. The birth is wonderful, we celebrate it, but he came to die. That's it. 
And this is the thing that he's asked to do. I don't want this to just be what it's often been for us, this quick ritual, let's take the bread, say a couple things, and off we go. Take whatever time you need. You're, you're almost here at home. But this is important. This is the time to just go to him. If you've been struggling with your prayer life, tell him that. If there's something in the family, if there's something, he, whatever's there, he wants to hear it. He wants to be with you. That's why he died. And I want to just read this to you this morning from 1 Corinthians 11. Doug had mentioned this to me, and I saw it too, that I just love the way Peterson translates this in the message. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. He says, let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it's so centrally important. I received my instructions from the Master himself and passed them on to you. The Master Jesus, on the night of his, his betrayal, took bread. Having given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. What you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions the death of the master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. You must never let familiarity breed contempt. right there. And so I'm just going to encourage you to, to take whatever time you need to, to reflect, to think about what God did for us. Lord, I do thank you that you came knowing all along that you would suffer and die for people like us, and yet you did it anyway. You did it willingly. You did it with focus, and with love. I'm reminded of my friend's song that asks, did you think of me on the way to Calvary? And I think the answer for all of us, Lord, is yes. Lord, help us in to enter into this time, this season, with just the joy that you represent. Lord, help us to not get sideways with all the news and all the different things, but to focus on the fact that you came you bled, you died, and you've made everything brand new. For that, Lord, we are eternally grateful. Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat all of it. So later on that same night, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant 
in my blood. As often as you drink of this, remember me. Let's give thanks for his blood that was shed for us. Oh, Jesus, how can we thank you enough for all that you did, all that you endured, and how you stayed true to the Father's will? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for enduring the cross, scorning its shame. You kept the joy of us coming to be with you in heaven before you as you endured all that, Lord. Then we pray, we ask for your strength. We know we are weak, Lord. We need you. Help us in these difficult times, Lord. Thank you for being right here, for being our hope, our joy, our life. We just want to take some time now and be in your presence and confess our sin to you and thank you for your blood shed for us, Lord. In your name, amen. the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And praise the Lord, Jesus shed his blood for you and for me. Let's take and drink all this together.
him. Join us for our Bible study, for youth ministry, and, uh, and God bless. See you back on Sunday.